hardly need me to tell you that the electrical equipment used in today's Buicks is getting to be more and more sophisticated. Yeah, the electrical age we've been hearing about all these years has definitely arrived. And you can expect to see more and more sophisticated equipment on future Buicks. I'm sure you've heard people say you need a degree in electrical engineering just to work on cars anymore. Granted, the more you know about the operation of the different gadgets, the easier it is to figure out how a system works. But I assure you, I've fixed more electrical complaints than I've had hot meals. And believe me, I'm no electrical engineer. But there's something you must have when diagnosing electrical problems, and that's a well-organized approach, a good plan of attack, so to speak. Now, I know people who do a lot of electrical work develop their own styles for solving problems, and that's just fine. There aren't really any hard and fast rules. But even so, for an overall approach to the whole business of diagnosis and repair of electrical systems, it's hard to beat the four-step plan recommended in Section 8A of the Service Manual. Let's run over those four steps quickly. Then we look at each one in more detail. The first thing to do after reading the repair order is to verify the complaint. Now, before you can fix anything, you've got to know what the problem is. Once the complaint is confirmed, the next step is to look over the schematic for the circuit in question. Well, the idea here is to familiarize yourself with how the system operates. Then comes the diagnosis. The detective work, you might say. Now, this is the point where you perform different tests and checks to narrow down the cause of the problem. Then, of course, you repair it. The fourth step, and a very important one, is to retest the system. You know, to be sure your repairs have fixed the problem completely. Well, those are the basic steps. Now, let's get a little bit more specific. Let me turn the clock back a little way and we'll look at what Jim did when this car first got to his bay. In this case, the customer's complaint concerns the cruise control system. Apparently, the car surges when the cruise is engaged. Jim will need to do a road test to confirm a cruise control problem. But notice that he's referring to the service manual first. Now, I can almost hear some of you thinking that it seems sort of amateurish, unprofessional, to go to the service manual, especially so soon. In fact, it's actually a darn good idea for a number of reasons. For a start, to understand why a system doesn't work, you have to know how it's supposed to work. But there's so much electrical stuff on the newer cars, you could never memorize it all. And as far as professionalism goes, look at the commercial airline pilots. They're pretty professional, huh? Yet, a pilot has to go through his pre-flight checklist every time he takes off, no matter how many times he's flown. How would you feel if you were taking a flight and the pilot told you he was going to skip the checklist and go on his memory instead? <laughs> I could go on, but... Anyway, my point is, the service manual can give you valuable tips to use for every one of the four steps we just looked at. The trick is in knowing how and when to use the manual to your best advantage. The electrical diagnosis section, section 8A, has changed quite a bit over the years. So, let's check out how it looks right now and see how you can put it to work for you. Section 8A is divided into numbered cells. The first five cells contain the index and general information on how to use the manual and how to read the circuit schematics and the symbols used in them. There are also descriptions of how to use troubleshooting tools in conjunction with the schematics and repair procedures, like wire splicing, fixing connectors, and so on. Next, come the cells for all the different electrical systems, standard and optional. Each system cell begins with a circuit schematic that starts from the power source 
and runs through the harnesses, switches, connectors, and all the other components that make up the system. Following the circuit schematic is a component location list. That's a list of all the components, connectors, grounds, and splices in that order shown in the schematic. The next item is a list of troubleshooting hints. The list gives you some useful shortcuts and checks you should try before getting any deeper into system diagnostics. You know, checking fuses and that sort of thing. Where appropriate, the troubleshooting hints directs you to a system check. This is usually in table form. It tells you what the normal results should be when you operate the system in various ways. Notice that I said where appropriate because of the way they work. Some systems don't have a normal operation check. For instance, you can't check for normal operation of the starter or the charging system if the engine won't start. In such cases, the troubleshooting hints give you a list of preliminary checks to make, then direct you to system diagnosis. Before we get into diagnostics, Let's recap how to use the information we've covered so far. Remember, the first step is to verify the complaint. We saw how Jim went to the manual before taking the car out for a road test. He was looking up the system check table for normal operation of the cruise control. The table gives a list of all the actions to be performed during the road test and what should happen when the system is functioning properly. For example, one check when the car is cruising above 25 miles an hour is to tap the cruise set button. In normal operation, this car's speed should decrease by one mile an hour each time you tap the button. As I said, everybody has their way of working, but Jim's use of the system check to verify the complaint makes good sense. Also, by holding off from touching anything, Till he's finished the normal operation check, he can compare how the system behaves before and after he's worked on it. Good idea for you, too. Once you've verified that there is a problem and you know the nature of it, then you can move on to the second recommended step, reading the circuit schematic. One difficulty facing technicians today is distinguishing between the growing number of circuits on cars. The schematics in Section 8A are designed to ease the situation by breaking the entire vehicle electrical system into manageable units or cells. This way, you aren't distracted by having to look at wiring that's not a part of the circuit you're working on. When another circuit does affect or is affected by the operation of a system, the schematic shows the splice and refers you to the appropriate cell for the other circuit. Switches, connectors, modules, and other components of the circuit are shown in simplified form on the schematic. This makes it easier to trace from the source, usually at the top of the page, through the components to ground. The third step of our four-step approach is to find the cause of the problem and repair it, which is really just a continuation of reading the circuit schematic. In fact, after you've identified the nature of the complaint, the schematic may well provide all the additional information you need to find the cause and repair it. If you aren't sure of the cause at this stage, then go on to system diagnosis. The style of the system diagnosis varies according to what is most appropriate for the system. The most common form is the symptom table followed by a series of tests. The power door lock cell is a good example. The left side of the symptom table lists all the most common symptoms associated with the locks. Opposite the symptoms is a list of the appropriate tests. Each test is identified by a letter. This letter corresponds to test procedures that follow the symptom table. In this case, the test is to measure voltage at the door lock switch. The measuring points in the test are given in the same form they appear in the schematic. For example, here you measure voltage between the orange wire at terminal D on the door lock switch and ground. A battery voltage reading is the correct result. 
If no battery voltage is present, the four diagnosis column refers to the next item, which is to check the courtesy fuse, and then test for an open in the orange wire. Sometimes the system diagnosis is in the form of a tree chart, like this one for the keyless entry system on the 89 Regal. Refer to the component location list if you need help in locating any of the items shown on the schematic while performing tests. The center column of the list gives a brief description of where each item is located on the car. To the right of each item, there's a reference to a page number and a figure in cell 201. Cell 201 contains drawings showing the on-car location of just about every component, ground, splice, connector, and grommet contained in the schematics. The component location list also gives the number of cavities in each connector listed. You can also find diagrams of many of the connector faces in cell 202. The diagrams list the wire color and circuit number for each cavity. Anytime you have questions about the operation of a system, there's more help at the end of each cell. The circuit operation page describes the various components of the circuit and how they work together. Now, I have something new to show you, a new design electrical systems manual from the Sabre, Electra, and Park Avenue models. Let's call it the ESM for short. The idea behind the ESM is to provide a single source with all the information you need to locate, diagnose, and repair electrical complaints, and to present that information in a graphic format it's easy to read and easy to use. The main elements of the ESM are basically the same as those in Section 8A. You also use the ESM in pretty much the same way. One of the first things you'll notice, besides the different shape, is that there is very little text in the ESM. Instead, information is provided in the form of illustrations and tables. The ESM has eight sections, and instead of cell numbers, each section is identified by an appropriate graphic symbol. The symbols which appear in the upper corners of the pages make it easy to find the different sections. The index page also gives you an alphabetical listing of the systems and components covered under each section heading. Just like in section 8A, each system begins with a circuit schematic. But the larger size of the ESM allows most circuits to be displayed on a single page. The notes on the schematics give you additional information about how a system works, as well as helpful troubleshooting hints. For the component location list, the ESM uses drawings immediately after the schematic. These drawings show in detail where all of the items contained in the schematic are located on the car. In the drawings, harness connectors are identified by vehicle location, color, and terminal pin letters or numbers. Fuses and relays which affect the system are also identified. In most cases, after the locator views, there is a system check procedure to test for normal operation. As we saw earlier, the system check can be used to help verify a complaint. Now, you might ask, what if you do the system check and everything operates normally? This could mean that the reported complaint never really existed. Well, it happens, but I'm afraid it's more likely that you're faced with an intermittent problem. I know they can be a real nuisance to find, but sometimes the ESM can help in these situations too. Here's how. After the system normal operation check comes the symptom diagnosis guide with a list of symptoms and appropriate diagnostic steps for each symptom. Read through the symptoms till you find one that is closest to the complaint. Then look at the appropriate test and identify which connectors are involved. Keep in mind faulty wiring connectors are the most common cause of electrical problems, including intermittence. Connectors have to withstand extremes of heat, cold, vibration, moisture, as well as dirt and corrosion. So the bottom line is, 
always clean connectors and check the terminals before condemning any parts. Following the symptom diagnosis guide are the actual diagnostic tests used to check system wiring and components. Now this is where the drawings in the ESM really come into their own. Almost every test procedure is fully illustrated to show how test equipment should be hooked up to the connector terminals. Now that's really handy because it eliminates the need for a lot of text explaining the test. A special feature of the new style manual is the inclusion of detailed replacement procedures for system related components. The procedures include notes on component handling and fastener torque specifications. Usually, you'd have to go to one or more other sections of the chassis manual to find this sort of information. And there's more. A service parts information table at the end of each section gives the parts catalog reference name and group number for each replacement component of the system. Like in section 8A, the general information section contains suggestions on how to use the manual, as well as repair procedures for the various connectors, fusible links, and splices. The trick to efficient diagnosis is to familiarize yourself with the published electrical information so that you know how to quickly find what you need to solve problems. In case you're wondering, I haven't forgotten the fourth step, test the repair. And neither is Jim. He's going for another road test where he'll go through the normal operation check again to make sure he's fixed the problem. Onboard computers, along with cams and other sophisticated scan tools, have made a lot of diagnostic jobs easier. But the most important tool in electrical repair is still the service manual. Of course, you'll always get problems that seem to defy any reasonable explanation. Still, with your own working knowledge of the car's electrical system and proper use of the manual, you should be able to handle just about any situation. The great American